Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jörg Haas, and uh, maybe we will wait another few seconds until uh, more people come in. But I would like already to welcome you to this online event, to this online debate. Uh, I am, as I said, I'm, my name is Jörg Haas. I'm the head of the Division International Politics at the Heinrich Böll Foundation based here in Berlin in Germany and uh, I'm really looking forward to what's likely to be a very exciting and interesting event. I at least I'm curious uh, about what I'm going to learn. Um, we have had more than 100 um, people registering for this event so we hope that uh, a few will still joining and the number still is going up as I am speaking. Good, maybe I'll start with uh, my preliminary remarks and if people come in while I'm speaking, that's okay. Um, so this, is, uh, this session is dedicated to um, a new trade agreement, trade and investment agreement that is currently being negotiated. Um, a new and far-reaching investment treaty called the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. And this agreement is supposed to replace 26 existing bilateral uh, investment treaties between China and most EU member states. But it's far more ambitious than offering a mere update of these existing treaties. It will not only take account of the rights of existing foreign investors in each jurisdiction, but also aim at a far reaching liberalization of investment. China has been a very significant destination of investment, for investment from the EU over the past 30 years. And this was the result of an unprecedented global economic boom. Given the huge amounts uh, that are at stake of investment and the significant restrictions on EU companies in China, much of the European debate about this agreement has focused on the ability of the EU to extract Chinese concessions with respect to access to the Chinese market. So this is the level playing field debate. And this seems to be the foremost concern of EU policy makers. While these uh, offensive interests of the EU are no doubt relevant, we would nevertheless want to focus our attention in this study, in this discussion on the potential downsides and risks for the EU in enshrining rights for Chinese investors in Europe in an international investment treaty. We focus on such defensive interests because Chinese investment in the EU has grown significantly. And because investment treaties by their very nature restrict the ability of a state to regulate or even restrict foreign investment. China is at home to some of the biggest companies on earth. Some of them are state owned, some are private. But China has a very peculiar economic and political system in which the boundaries between the state and the private sector are blurred because behind the scenes, the communist party is present in both the state, in state-owned companies, and in privately-owned companies. The Communist Party is everywhere. Since China has embarked on a quite assertive course that put it at odds with human rights and in, with many European values, it is now seen by the EU as a negotiating partner, economic competitor, and a systemic rival. So a quite ambiguous and difficult relationship. This study tries to shed light on the potential risk of this wide ranging agreement with such a powerful and peculiar country. Little is currently publicly known about the substance of the agreement. So the ambitions of this study had to be quite modest, namely to identify potentially problematic areas that merit particular attention from European civil society and policymakers. And what we can present today is certainly not the final word on the China Europe investment agreement. It is rather the start of a debate. After the debacle on the TTIP agreement with the United States, 
the European Commission promised comprehensive transparency in trade negotiations. But up to now, actually very little is publicly known about a new treaty with very far reaching consequences that is supposed to be signed as early as the end of this year, at least according to some press releases and some press reports. It might take longer and actually I, I think it will probably take longer, but at least some announcements, announcements go in that direction. So I think the first step uh, for um, advancing the discussion is really a, 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 um, to allow us full transparency on what is going on. We hope now that this online seminar and that the study that it launches will help generate a much needed debate. What can you expect um, during the next 90 minutes? Um, we will first have a presentation of the study by its authors, Jessica Lawrence, Tara van Ho, and Anne Liemas. We, we will second have a comment by Markus Krajewski, and I will present all the panelists uh, in a minute. And thirdly, you will, we will have a round of exchanges uh, between the, and among the pan panelists. And last but not least, we will allow for Q&A from the audience. Uh, as a housekeeping uh, remark, please put your questions already and as they come al along in, into your mind into the Q&A tool, uh, which is at the bottom of your screen or should be there. And uh, we will try to uh, you know, answer them uh, at this final round of Q&A. But obviously it's always good if you have already put them by, during the discussion. Um, yeah, let's turn over to our um, panelists. Uh, we will first have this presentation um, of um, this interesting study. Tara van Ho is a lecturer in the School of Law and Human uh, Rights Center at the University of Ex Essex. She is also co-director of the Essex Business and Human Rights Project, a co-president of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association and a member of the editorial board of the Business and Human Rights Journal. Anil Yilmaz is also a lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Essex and a co-director of the Essex and Bu Business and Human Rights Project. And Jessica Lawrence, she is senior lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Essex. And she held also in the past various positions at NGOs, think tanks and universities in the United States, the EU, India, New Zealand and Costa Rica. So very widely traveled. Um, I will present uh, Marcus later on and hand over now to um, our team of authors of this new paper. So over to you. Thank you so much, Jörg, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm looking forward to today. Let me first just begin by sharing my screen. Good, hopefully that's visible to everyone. Um, so, uh, alongside my co-authors, um, we'd like to take the first 15 to 20 minutes of the session today to present the basic outline of the scoping study that we wrote uh, about this new agreement, the EU-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment. Uh, and before we turn it over to the panel discussion and then the audience questions. So first, a little bit of background for those that might be less familiar with the agreement. Um, the CAI uh, is a comprehensive agreement on investment uh, currently being negotiated between China and the EU. Um, negotiations have been going on for some time now, for the last seven years, uh, since 2013. There have been 34 negotiating rounds completed already, um, many of them this year. Uh, they are in talks again this week. Um, and this is because, as Jörg mentioned at the outset, there is an aim to conclude this agreement by the end of the year, or at least put out some type of um, political statement that the end is in sight. Um, although, as you will hear during the rest of our presentation, that would require some significant movement to happen on areas on which there is still quite a bit of disagreement. 
uh, this new agreement would replace 26 already existing uh, agreements between various of the EU member states, all of them except Ireland, in fact, and China. Uh, and what that means is that some of the stuff that is going to be in the CAI isn't new. Uh, so the basic investor protections that uh, the CAI includes uh, for things like protection against expropriation, non-discrimination, and so on, those are already present in the existing agreements, although they sometimes will be present here in the CAI in an updated form. But the comprehensive agreement goes further than all of these previous agreements uh, and covers a much broader scope uh, of areas um, than the existing treaties do. So it is adding new material in addition to consolidating the existing treaties into one single EU-wide agreement. Okay, so what is this new stuff? What goes beyond the basic investor protections? Well, first, uh, it contains protections for market access uh, and investment liberalization. That's things like getting rid of quotas on the number of investors who could enter a market or getting rid of joint venture requirements for foreign businesses. Uh, it includes rules about performance requirements like um, local content requirements, for example, as well as rules on domestic regulation. That's things like the transparency of licensing rules or the independence and impartiality of regulators. Uh, it has a chapter on financial services, which is something that you would normally see in a services agreement rather than a bilateral investment treaty. And it also includes proposals on some special areas of EU concern. So this agreement includes an investment and sustainable development chapter, at least the leaked version does, though as we'll see uh, later on, that's quite a contested area of the agreement. Uh, and it also contains dispute settlement provisions. Um, this uh, treaty contains both uh, investor state and state state dispute settlement and there is a discussion ongoing about whether or not that investor state dispute settlement in particular will move into the EU's new uh, version of this which it has been developing the investment court system or not. Uh, this is another one of the areas that is being uh, fought over at the moment uh, and in which disagreement still remains. So as Jörg mentioned as well, uh, a lot of the focus so far um, in things like commission presentations to civil society and so on has really been on looking at what EU investors might gain from an agreement like this. Um, but our study focuses specifically on the other side of the equation about a few of the potential downsides and risks of this agreement uh, for the EU, uh, EU businesses, for China and so on. And uh, in particular, things like, um, you know, uh, the lack of sufficient protections for public policy space, um, the potential interactions between EU and member state laws uh, and the protections in the agreement and what the impact of this greater level of discipline uh, could potentially be. So uh, specifically, we talk about four different kind of baskets of issues, uh, which we'll go through in the next four slides. Uh, so first, I'm going to ask Anil to comment on the next slide. Thank you, Jess, and thank you, York, for introducing us. Um, so I'm just going to uh, move on quickly here. Um, one of the most controversial aspects of investment treaties is the fair and equitable treatment standard, which um, those of you who are familiar with the investment treaty system will know. Um, it, it does, you know, it's, it's a very vague standard of treatment. It's been interpreted quite widely by investment arbitration tribunals. And it's, you know, cases that involve the invocation of this standard and its interpretation by tribunals has attracted um, serious criticism from civil society, from academics, from other stakeholders. 
And the EU has, um, like other um, bilateral investment treaty parties, has started to revisit um, the use of this standard in investment treaties. And, and what we see in this particular draft um, is, is an attempt to limit the scope of this fair and equitable treatment standard um, by listing um, several measures that may constitute a breach of the fair and equitable treatment standard. But what, what we argue in the report is that this is still not enough and it still leaves um, quite an ambiguity and a large um, radius for interpretation by investment arbitration tribunals or the investment court system if that ends up being the, the method of dispute resolution. Um, so um, what we, we did see, I'm looking at the actual, um, actual article right now and, and um, one of the main problems that we saw in, this, um, in the article that refers to the fair and equitable treatment standard is still a reference to the legitimate expectations of the investor. So although it does try to curtail um, the extent to which an investor's legitimate expectations can be protected uh, under the investment treaty, it still does protect legitimate expectations and it still um, it, it, it really actually legitimizes um, this, um, this leg of the fair and equitable treatment standard by, by expressly referring to it in, in the treaty. Um, in older generation treaties, there is no reference to this legitimate expectations phrase. Um, it's something that's been developed in case law. And, and, and what the EU does is to kind of stamp it uh, by including it in this agreement. So, so we think that the civil society actors um, and others interested should seriously scrutinize um, this fair and equitable treatment standard in the agreement. Um, the next issue that we look at is um, the right to regulate provisions. Um, again, um, responding to backlash against investment treaty claims, um, which states have, um, have faced, um, it, it, there's been serious criticism again that investment treaty claims have um, undermined states' right and duty to regulate in the interest of um, the public um, in the areas of human rights, environmental protection, and other areas of public interest. And so states have started introducing, including um, the EU itself, um, these provisions that affirm um, the right to regulate. But again, what we see here is, a, is, an, is, is the EU reaffirming this right, but not going beyond that. Um, states, of course, have a right to regulate. Um, reaffirming this right in a treaty is, is quite tokenistic, um, doesn't really introduce a, a new uh, restriction in this area. Um, it merely reaffirms um, an existing right and a duty to regulate in the public interest. Um, so what we see here also is a reference to to what extent the legitimate expectations of investors can be protected um, in the context of right to regulate. But again, it remains extremely weak and ambiguous um, in that respect. Um, there needs to be a, a more robust um, recognition of this right, but also clear exceptions um, that carve out areas of public interest from the protection of the treaty or, or limit its application to, for example, instances of only expropriation. Um, and again, the exceptions that we see in, in this treaty, which normally you wouldn't see in an investment treaty, um, um, th there is a modeling around um, what we see in the general agreement on trade and tariffs. And um, there, there are exceptions relating to um, um, public morals, et cetera. But again, um, these have been, if, if one looks at the WTO case law, these have been interpreted extremely narrowly. So they won't give sufficient um, defenses to member states to, to defend themselves against um, claims by investors on, on uh, measures 
concerning measures that actually introduce new regulations that aim to protect public morals, public security, and other public interests. I'm going to pass over to Jess here. Great. Um, so another category of issues that uh, we discuss in the report uh, has to do with the investment and sustainable development chapter. Uh, now, including trade and sustainable development chapters, or here an investment and sustainable development chapter, um, is one of the, uh, has been a hallmark of new generation uh, EU agreements. So, for example, the agreements with Singapore, Vietnam, Canada, all have these type of issues included. Uh, and it's one of the features of these new generation agreements that the Commission in particular, but the EU in general, holds out as making them progressive uh, agreements. Uh, these chapters essentially do things like affirming the party's international commitments on environmental and labor standards. Um, they commit the parties not to lower their current standards in order to attract investment uh, and establish a, a general framework for dialogue and cooperation on, on labor and environmental protection. Now, the TSD, the trade and sustainable development chapters that are included in other agreements have been criticized by academics, civil society and so on who are concerned with upholding uh, international protection standards due to their weakness. So they uh, generally are framed in best efforts language rather than imposing firm obligations in these various areas. Um, they are not subject to the normal dispute settlement mechanisms of the treaties. They don't have sanctions attached to violations of them and so on. Uh, and the oversight of these uh, chapters is also um, quite um, gentle, I'd say. It's provided by some uh, groups of civil society and business persons who are uh, come together in what's known as domestic advisory groups, who then can submit any observations that they have to the commission, who then has, which then has the uh, prerogative uh, of whether it wants to, to take um, uh, the domestic advisory groups up on any of their insights. Um, but even these uh, sort of weaker chapters that were included in previous agreements have been watered down uh, in what we have seen of the comprehensive agreement on investment with China. Um, in particular, it seems as though China has been pushing back quite hard on some of the uh, provisions that would normally be in such a chapter. Um, there is a, a desire not to include any language about ratifying or complying with ILO standards, um, which of course is a matter of concern because China is a party only to four of the eight ILO core conventions and has seen um, some uh, issues with respect to its attitude toward things like forced labor, freedom of association, uh, the right to organize and collective bargaining, and so on. Um, China also has been pushing back against the idea of non-state stakeholders participating in discussions of uh, these regulatory issues. And we've seen that the domestic advisory group mechanism has been eliminated altogether from uh, the leaked draft text of the agreement that we have seen so far. Uh, and it's been pushing back against the idea of third party dispute settlement at all, even the weak forms that were included, um, the weak sort of mutually agreed solution focused uh, forms that were included in previous agreements. So the contents of this particular chapter is going to be a very important area to keep an eye on once we finally see um, a negotiated text. All right, uh, I will pass back over to Anil now. Okay, um, so another area that we highlighted in the report is this issue of market access. Um, and there are various um, issues that arise from the market access provisions. But one of the things we would like to highlight here is um, the question of market access and investment screening. Um, policies of the EU and member states. Um, 
what market access what the market access provisions in the agreement attempt to do is to liberalize um entry of investments from china to the eu and from eu to the, to china um by um, removing barriers to establishment in terms of um, the number of businesses or the amount of um, amounts of funds that can be invested or um, remove preconditions to investment, etc. Um, but what we not noticed is that there was nothing really to safeguard um, the policy space of the EU or allow it to screen investments um in in critical infrastructure in critical areas in in areas of the economy that the eu considers critical and um and these include um technologies energy um education finance um not all of the you know areas of these sectors but certain areas of these sectors have been considered as critical by the eu and the EU has also introduced a, an investment screening, foreign investment screening regulation that it works with member states um, to, to make sure that um, investors into critical infrastructure within the EU are screened and, and receive permission um, before they enter. Uh, and therefore, um, they can't simply access the market uh, um, according to that regulation. But this agreement doesn't really carve out that policy space um, for, for the EU. There are a few areas in, the, in energy sectors, a few member states have um, in, in the draft, as far as we could tell, have uh, attempted to introduce some, some carve outs in, in, ener in the energy sector specifically, and some really minor carve outs in telecommunications. Um, but looking at um, the broader objectives of the EU with the FDI screening regulation, uh, we see a mismatch here and we see um, potentials for claims, especially discrimination claims by Chinese investors if, if the agreement is signed as, as it appears right now without any carve outs for critical sectors. Um, we can anticipate that there will be claims by Chinese investors if they are then screened out uh, from accessing, from investing into those areas that are considered critical by, um, by the EU. So what, what we suggest is that these areas that, that the EU considers critical should be addressed um, by way of carve outs uh, from protection. Uh, at least as far as the market access provisions go um, to avoid um, discrimination claims being brought against um, against the EU or member states under the treaty. Now I'm going to pass over to Tara. Thanks, Anil. The final thing we want to mention is the human rights implications of the CAI. Now, the EU did commission or, or had prepared a sustainability impact assessment that was done in 2017. Unfortunately, there are two fundamental flaws with the human rights portion of this, of this assessment. First, it lacks the data necessary to really assess the impact of the CAI, particularly on issues of economic inequality, um, or how, and, and more specifically, how the CAI could create or exacerbate issues of discrimination within China. The report was prepared in 2017, and this is quite significant because that was the same year that the Xinjiang uh, internment camps were revealed to the public. That forced, those forced labor camps are only mentioned once in the report, uh, and that's in a footnote. So the significance and seriousness of the CAI on labor rights within China and on issues of discrimination within China simply don't factor into the assessment as they should and as is necessary if the EU is to respect its human rights obligations. There are also very few stakeholder consultations in the preparation of the report. There are only 150 stakeholders in all of China. Only 10 human rights organizations in Europe were consulted, only six human rights organizations in China, and only 31 academics between the two states or sorry, two parties. 
And what that means is that there simply isn't enough information from the public. The public hasn't had an opportunity to really discuss what the implications of this will be or whether or not these implications align with our values within the EU or with our expectations for EU and China relations. These fundamental flaws also mean that the SAI was always incompatible with the EU's uh, human rights commitments, and it was always an incomplete assessment. With the passage of time, it becomes even more so. As I mentioned, uh, the Xinjiang internment camps were revealed in 2017. They were noted as an issue of ethnic discrimination within the assessment. But since then, we've been able to really understand the significance of the forced labor uh, issues within those internment camps. And we're also aware that European companies have been involved in those camps and, and in the, uh, in that European companies have benefited from the use of forced labor within, within those camps. This raises two issues. First, it breaches the EU's fundamental values and it undermines EU's stated commitment to ensuring that its businesses respect human rights. It also creates an unfair playing field for European laborers who are right to demand a fair and equitable compensation for their labor. But if they are put into direct and sustained competition with Chinese laborers, which is what part of the stated goal of the CAI is to encourage sustained investment within China and between China and the EU, this will put EU laborers in direct competition with people who are being forced into labor and are not being adequately compensated. This means that EU laborers are likely to miss out on the benefits of the CAI and on what the CAI promises. Since 2007, China has also adopted the Hong Kong national security law. And when we talk about the responsibility of EU states to respect human rights, the Hong Kong national security law points to some serious and grave concerns that the EU should have in mind when ratifying this treaty. China currently requires companies to breach human rights. This is not just true in Xinjiang, but it is true with the Hong Kong national security law where EU companies are being asked to report when their employees express dissident views. And more broadly, we see it in terms of uh, the retainment and sharing of privacy and data information with the Chinese national authorities. Currently, France is the only EU state to have a mandatory human rights due diligence law, but the EU under German leadership has promised to introduce such a law for all states within, or for all businesses within the EU. This will require EU businesses to undertake mandatory human rights due diligence and to develop plans to mitigate their human rights impacts. The problem is, is that currently, there is no ability to reconcile that expectation with Chinese laws that require EU companies operating within China to breach human rights. Without clarity over the relationship between the CAI and the mandatory human rights due diligence standards, EU companies are being put in, a, in an impossible predicament. But more importantly and more likely, the mandatory human rights due diligence law will have very little effect, undermining again the EU's commitment to furtherance of human rights. This could be addressed through an investor obligation clause. Unfortunately, there is currently no investor obligation, uh, obligations mentioned in the draft. And it's unlikely that such an investor obligation clause would both be included, requiring investors to respect human rights, let alone protect or fulfill them. But even if it were, it's unclear how much this would be respected or enforced uh, by either the ISDS tribunals that currently generally enforce international investment agreements or by the EU's new um, investment court system. Without an oblig oblig obligation on investors to respect human rights, the reality is, is that we are opening up our relationships between the EU and China to significant abuse of human rights and labor standards. Several tribunals, sorry, one tribunal has recognized that investors may have negative obligations towards human rights as a general matter of international law. And others have said the same about environmental law. But it's unclear how much tribunals or courts would respect this in the future. 
These are not binding precedential uh, decisions. And so tribunals and courts will have to assess for themselves whether or not states or the EU has an ability to enforce human rights provisions uh, against investors, including in the area of what, when investors breach human rights. To clarify that the investors' actions can affect their level of protection and that states can hold investors accountable for human rights, there needs to be a clear provision outlining investors' obligations to respect human rights. This is a particularly important issue where investors will be operating in areas that are previously government services. So areas of water, electricity, energy, and also when it comes to issues of data privacy and protection. The SIA claims, so that the sustainability impact assessment claims that the CIA may improve freedom of expression within China. Unfortunately, this is an ideological belief that is not backed up by any data. That's both true generally within the sustainability impact assessment and more generally within the literature and studies around this issue. It's particularly true when it comes to China, there is no evidence that, the, that increased investment by EU states or EU companies would lead to greater respect for freedom of expression. And there is no specific right to privacy in the agreement. This sits in contravention to the EU and Australian draft proposal, which allows each state party to pursue its own approach to the issue of privacy and data control. Even if the CAI pursued the EU Australian approach, leaving data protection and privacy up to each party means that China can continue to follow its own course of action right now. It would be impossible for EU regulators to monitor GDR compliance, GDPR compliance by Chinese investors, and it could overwhelm the EU system for data privacy and protection, fundamentally leaving our data and privacy up to the goodwill of Chinese companies and the Chinese government. So with that, we're going to end um, our portion of the presentation and we look forward to continuing the dialogue in the future. Thank you, Tara, um, for the, and uh, Anil and Jessica for uh, this comprehensive presentation of your report. Um, I'm now handing over to Markus Krajewski. Uh, Markus is university professor at the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg. He holds the chair of uh, in public law and public international law there. He is one of the program directors of the MA in human rights, and he's the chairperson of the Interdisciplinary Research Center for Human Rights, Erlangen Nuremberg. He is also the chair of the board of trustees of the German Institute for Human Rights and General secretary general of the German branch of the International Law Association. Uh, Markus, over to you to your comment. Thank you very much, Jörg, um, and um, thank you for allowing me to comment, um, or say a few words on this great report. First of all, thank you to Heinrich Böll Foundation for commissioning this study, and of course, uh, to my three great colleagues at the University of Essex for writing the study and coming up with um, such a comprehensive analysis. Now, I think what I want to do in this comment is not try to go into too many details of sort of some technical legal debate. I guess we can do that a little bit later, but rather, come up with three more general observations, which also relate to the process and maybe also to contextualize um, uh, uh, this proposal, these negotiations, this agreement um, from a political perspective. And then three, maybe a little bit more specific observations, um, which go into um, sort of the, some of the issues that have been discussed in uh, the presentation and also are being discussed in the report. Now, the first thing, and I think this was, this was made very clear, but I just want to underline it and, and, and emphasize it, is this is really a new type of an agreement. Um, this is, this is a, a, we, we haven't seen this, certainly not in the EU context. And as far as I know, um, there's, there's not really sort of a general global template on this type of an agreement yet. And, and, and it, I think Oliver Prausmiller also mentioned that in the, in the chat. Um, what exactly is the relation? And, and, and of course, it's important to, to, to realize that because when we analyze this, we analyze it against existing templates. And so, of course, when we analyze the investment protection parts of the agreement, we analyze that against existing templates that we have and the debates that we have there. But we need to realize that we also 
need to analyze the contents of this agreement against the, uh, the template of the GATS. And from that perspective, it's very clear that this would be a GATS plus agreement because it would go beyond um, the services liberalization commitments that the EU and um, China have made in the context of the WTO. Markus, uh, quick, for the non-expert, the GATS is the General oh, yeah. Agreement of Trade in Services for yes, those I'm who sorry. are not. <laughs> yes, okay. I'm sorry. So, so, thank you very much. Uh, um, so basically, we are looking at investment agreements and World Trade Organization or trade agreements. And um, because I saw some trade experts in the, in the, in the audience already, um, so I want to mention that. But in addition to that, and this makes it even more controversial, I would argue, we don't know yet whether it would just cover liberalization in services investment or whether it would also cover liberalization in goods production, production investment. So what I want to highlight here is this is, this is a new type of an agreement where, which we don't have an existing template yet when we analyze it. And this brings me to my second general point. And I think this relates also to the first question uh, by, by Bart Jabferbeek in, the, in the, um, the comment. This is not as we were originally promised uh, by the EU Commission that from now on there would be transparency. This draft is not public. Um, and there are rumors that maybe there's already a new draft. Um, so we are once again in this whole debate about that we are discussing very important issues from a public policy perspective based on documents which are not publicly available. And I, I find that this is uh, uh, an important uh, problem and we need to sort of repeat that and, and demand for transparency because if there's no transparency, it's impossible to actually come up with any analytical or political um, um, assessments. And then finally, this is just sort of as a footnote, maybe specifically for those who are interested in political questions, this will be a so-called mixed agreement. So basically it means it's an agreement which both the EU and therefore the European Parliament has to ratify, but also the member states and therefore all the um, uh, parliaments of the member states as well. And that's of course also important from sort of a broader political perspective. Now, let me come now very briefly to the three more specific comments. And here I want to remind um, everyone, especially those who worked on trade and investment issues in the past, that we've been told by the European Commission and the European Union that what amounts to the golden standard of EU agreements is now the agreement with Canada. Now, I'm not going to comment on that. Actually, I, well, I'm going to comment on that because I don't believe it's the golden standard, but that's what they've been telling us. So when we look at that, when we assume that this is the golden standard, then we can definitely see that what is, is out there now is certainly way below the golden standard. And um, uh, Jessica and Anil and, and Tara, I think aptly demonstrated that. It is way beyond, way below what we see in current uh, uh, EU agreements when it comes to trade and sustainable development, both um, substantially, but also procedurally. It doesn't rely on civil society uh, input in the domestic ac um, advisory groups and so forth and so forth. So it falls short to the so-called golden standard in the area of trade and sustainability, environment and labor. Secondly, um, when it comes to um, um, investment protection, um, and here I want to, I guess, make a comment to a question uh, by Chiara um, Miglioli. Um, if I understood what I've seen, but this is of course all speculation correctly, um, the current draft or the one that is been seen by some, would not cover market access under the investment protection chapter. But that's maybe something that also um, Jessica and Neil and Tara want to comment on. But that just shows that there is, it would be so important to be able to publicly debate um, this. But anyway, the investment protection chapter is of course an issue and we would need to know, um, and we would need to demand that um, many of the, the comments and the critique that we had on the, um, or many of us had at least on the investor state dispute settlement system, the old one, the one that the EU Commission itself labeled as outdated, they seem to be coming back now. So that this is the second issue. And the, the final issue is, of course, um, and this brings me back to uh, the first general comment I made, um, and also something that um, Anil was talking about. When we want to know how far this would actually go beyond 
commitments which already exist in the World Trade Organization, we are faced with a technical difficulty because this agreement, at least partly, seems to be following what is called in trade language a negative list approach. Whereas in the World Trade Organization, so far at least, everything has been on a positive list approach. So that makes the analysis um, even more uh, complicated. And that brings me back to this, the second general comment I made. We definitely need transparency to discuss these things. Thank you very much. Marcos, before I hand over to, to the further debate, could you briefly still explain uh, negative and positive list approaches? To our yes, audience? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. This is um, sort of a, a, a technical issue in trade agreements. Now, if you have a trade agreement, and I'll make this hopefully very, very uh, easy to understand, um, you basically say, I open a market. And then under a positive list approach, you would have to say, I open the market for telecommunications, financial services, but not education and not health. And then you specifically say for which areas you open the market and for which, um, for all the ones that you didn't open, that you didn't put on a positive list, um, there's no obligation. The negative list approach is the other way around. You're basically saying, I open the market for everything except for the ones that I specifically mentioned. And of course, if you compare the two, technically they could be the same, but it's very difficult to, to actually see that at first glance. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, Marcus, uh, that was really, really helpful. Um, we have already a, a, an interesting list of questions, um, but I, I will still want to to uh, in, in one first round of, of questions from me to the panelists also make flesh out a little bit more what what we are talking about eh? because it, I find it you know this trade stuff is often quite abstract and um, can we get a bit more more of an idea what what kind of uh, investment and what kind of services would be liberalized. I am just I mean, not sure how many of you have been in China, but obviously, if you travel in China, I at least have been traveling quite a lot there. You know, you are surrounded by Chinese digital firms, by WeChat, by Alipay, by <laughs> digital payment firms or digital uh, services of all sorts. And this means, I mean, with these kind of digital services being liberalized, um, or not, uh, or, or uh, another question. I mean, have yesterday been in a new subway station in Berlin, they have been video cameras. These are operated by service providers. Would Chinese video surveillance companies who are the best in the world because they have the biggest AI, they have the best facial recognition now, be entered the market for services of this kind? <laughs> I would be nervous about it. So, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, health services based on artificial intelligence and genetic information, education services, universities, media. Are these kind of services that potentially could be covered or not? Uh, what do we know about this? Not sure who wants to take it um, from maybe our should Essex I, group. Yeah. Should I have a go at this? Um, mm. I think it all goes back to what Marcus was saying about transparency, because we don't know. Um, it's an agreement that liberalizes everything, like that negative approach that he was explaining. And then it will introduce schedules uh, where the list will be included to exclude areas. And we don't know, we simply don't know right now, based on the information available, what will and will not be included. Um, so I, I'm... I guess that doesn't really give you a clear answer, but that's that's the answer we have right now. I don't know if so we anybody will, else. We, we will be we will be dependent upon what the EU puts on a negative list. <laughs> yeah, so it liberalizes everything except. Uh, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, good. That is that is already um, quite helpful. Um, I would actually move on to. Um, not sure whether you among would have questions to Marcus uh, from the Essex group or or Marcus has questions still to um, the other way around. Um, I don't see this currently. 
yeah, maybe you just open up your, your videos and <laughs> can see what, um, if there are questions for you among each other on the panel uh, or whether we should immediately move into the Q&As that have been on. I mean, we have a number of interesting questions already. Um, I just wanted to add one thing on, yeah. on uh, to what Marcus already said about the the negative listing approach. I think this is um, this isn't the only agreement that the EU has taken a negative list approach in, uh, but it does both. Sometimes it goes with positive list where it affirmatively lists the things to be liberalized. Other times it goes the other way and says the things that you know won't be liberalized. But I wanted to just emphasize that if you take this negative list approach like they appear to be doing in the negotiations with China that really sets up a kind of future trajectory that is geared toward ever increasing liberalization because anything that you didn't think of to exclude at the outset will become automatically included as time goes on. Whereas with the other approach, the positive listing approach requires an affirmative step. You have to list it in order to liberalize it. So the trajectory is less expansive than in an agreement uh, of this type. And I think that's an important difference uh, with the previous or with some other EU agreements. And in particular, in a case where the negotiation is with such a big power with so many large uh, investors who have a very deep pockets and uh, have the potential to really um, come into the European market in a, in a major way. Um, another uh, thing that I wanted to note about this kind of uh, weakening of the the investment and sustainable development chapter is that it seems a real pity, um, especially given sort of the EU's overall development of a new gold standard of an investment policy. Now, even its gold standard in CETA and so the Canada agreement and so on have been criticized. Um, as Marcus also rightly points out. Uh, but what we have there is better than what we have here. What the EU is demanding of Vietnam and Singapore and even Korea, which has weaker protections than some of the later agreements, uh, is less than what's in this current agreement. And that seems to me to be the opposite of the direction that we would like to see the EU moving uh, toward developing a more progressive trade and investment policy rather than watering that policy down when it suits the needs of you know, um, uh, European sort of business communities. Yep, Marcus. Can, can I just make that even maybe even more to the point? I mean, it seems to us, it seems to me that when, when the EU is negotiating with smaller, weaker partners, which Canada is from the EU perspective, which Vietnam is, which Singapore is, then it's all well and nice to have the golden standard. But if on the they have you know another partner, then all of a sudden they seem to forget about it. So I think that that's very important. And I also wanted to add one other footnote. Um, I don't know, many, many may have seen this, but I believe it was yesterday or the day before yesterday that Belgium asked the European Court of Justice as to whether the current model of dispute settlement under the Energy Charter Treatment, which is an, the Energy Charter Treaty, sorry, the Energy Charter Treaty, which is an, an old investment type agreement, whether that's compatible with EU law. So basically, we are, we are seeing this development here also in the EU itself. And of course, we would expect that this is something that is reflected in the negotiations. I, I see one question, which um, is a, in some way technical, but I think it's, it's maybe important in, in terms of clarification. Oliver Prausmüller uh, says, um, uh, that he say liberalization commitments typically are not covered by investment state dispute settlement, ICS, ICS, and uh, whether there are indications that the, um, the CIA would change this. Um, what do we know or what heavy indications do we have? Uh, I'll, I'll just start and then I'll let uh, Anil jump in and Marcus and Tara to clarify. I mean, um, it seems that uh, there were some indications early on that China wanted to expand uh, the application of 
ISDS uh, to include some um, pre-investment uh, areas. However, from the leaked draft that we saw from last year, um, it looked as though this was not going to be the case. Um, however, the draft is not final. There were some sort of questions about why things were in the places they were and so on. So this would be something to absolutely confirm at the end of the day that, that none of these uh, further steps have been taken. Yet another reason why it would be really, really good for us to be able to see some kind of officially released negotiating text so that we could gain you know, a final uh, clear statement on, on this issue. I'll just I'll just add one point to what Jess said. Um, what seemed clear to us from the, the the leaked draft that we saw was that um, the entire agreement is subject to state to state dispute settlement, which again is subject to probably will be probably subject to arbitration or the investment court system if that is the model adopted. Um, so even if an investor cannot mount a claim against an EU member state or the EU under the agreement, um, China still can or the EU or the member states can against China in terms of market access issues. So, so you know, as there are, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I mean, the, the separation between the state and the private investor is in China less pronounced. Um, uh, essentially, large Chinese companies could convince <laughs> the Chinese state to to invoke this uh, dispute settlement uh, state to state. Okay, that's interesting to know. Um, I have, I am now moving on really not more fully to the, the, the questions that we have in the Q and A and there's a number of really interesting stuff and it's it's really difficult to, to choose the right ones, but uh, I, I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, Chiara Miglioli has said, uh, the EU FDI screening regulation covers security in public order dimensions. Screening can only be done in relation to the, those dimensions. So uh, why would the right to regulate exceptions of the CIA not be enough? Shall I go, Jess, Tara, okay. Um, so potentially um, if there was a claim, um, brought by a Chinese investor arguing that they've been discriminated against because of the FDI screening process. Um, it would be up to that tribunal that decides that case, whether there was de facto discrimination, whether there was a real justification um, for EU or a member state to exclude that Chinese investor on security grounds. So, while it's possible to argue for the EU or a member state defend themselves by invoking public security, the final determination will be with, uh, with the arbitral tribunal to see whether the, the measure was um, the, the exclusion of a Chinese investor on public security grounds were based on genuine um, security interests or not. So the EU or a member state would have to then prove that this was a genuine um, security um, threat. And, and that can be quite challenging, I think, and can be a protracted dispute settlement process. Yeah, Marcus. Can I just add one point? Because I think uh, Anil made that also very clear in her presentation. Um, and I just want to re-emphasize it, that the right to regulate clause is of no help in this context because it doesn't give any defense to the state defending that. So we should, the, the right to regulate is really sort of a big fog thing that, uh, that really gets into our way of understanding how these agreements operate. So the only question is really, can they justify it based on the exceptions? So I just wanted to underline that, sorry. One thing that we see, sorry, Jess, uh, maybe you were going to say this, but one thing that we saw in the agreement, the draft was that they excluded public security from the exceptions. Um, so, so that then again, can create complications when if, if and when such a claim is mounted. Just, just, just to ex explain the excluded public security from the exceptions to what to the to the coverage of um, of the treaty, so uh, there are certain. Um, so it's inc included. 
No, uh, so so the EU cannot, EU or China cannot defend their actions mm. um, by re relying on public security mm. under the exceptions clause, which which is a clause that is included in the draft. They can rely on public morals, so they can mm. uh, defend the measure, arguing that this is a matter of public morals, or um, or uh, or normally public security would be included, or public health. Uh, but they they have explicitly, strangely excluded public security uh, from that list of exceptions um, mm -hmm. that the EU um, or China can invoke as a defense. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe yeah, I'm now exploring just a you know this kind of maybe a weird example. But you know when traveling in China, I was really feeling permanently covered by by video surveillance. It's just omnipresent there and. Now assume I'm now in the in the Berlin subway and there is video surveillance as well. There's a, a company operating this on behalf of the the Berlin subway. Which so could could a Chinese investor say, okay, I will provide these services to the Berlin subway and and claim, okay, I, that's my right as an investor to pro, to offer this and and if I make a good offer, I mean this will be kind of difficult difficult to be excluded from this. I mean, I, I, I think, I, I'm, I'm hypothesizing, I, I must yeah, say, yeah, but it's yeah. still, you know, it's just give. I think as the text stands, I think there is no reason why a Chinese investor couldn't invest in in um, mm. in uh, managing or operating the surveillance system in, in the okay. subway. Mar <laughs> Marcus has something. No, I Marcus. just want to point out that this, mm. this is actually a question of public procurement. I mean, if you're talking about the, mm -hmm. the, the Okay. Berlin subway or any sort of you know public mm. agency, then it would be the question whether that mm. procurement market is actually open. But okay. um, it, it could, of course, be in, in any private context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So good. Yeah, I mean, it's it's I'm asking these kind of stupid questions because in some way we need a little bit of get of a of a of an imagination. You know what it what it actually means. Um, I have. Um, many obviously interesting questions. And I take just um, uh, another one. Um, what is the EU's goal or target about uh, regarding labor standards and environmental standards in the um, CII? And um, a, a related question, did the Chinese give any reasons or detail for pushing back on the labor standards? It's, is it because of content or reference to international uh, organizations in the ILO? Um, I mean, obviously, we have not direct access to the negotiations. So, can we um, can we respond to this? Yeah, Jessica. Um, so, uh, in in its prior agreements, new generation agreements, the EU makes reference specifically to the eight ILO core conventions and other conventions uh, under the ILO that are up to date and so on. Um, and in things like, you know, the Vietnam Agreement or, or something like this, uh, it also has been pushing Vietnam to, to uh, ratify conventions that it hasn't uh, yet ratified uh, and to make sure that it implements uh, the conventions that it has ratified. Now, the text itself uh, of those other agreements um, doesn't explicitly require the end result of ratification, but it has language in it that requires a sustained effort to work toward the ratification of any of these conventions that have not yet been ratified. Now, um, China, uh, there was a note in, in one of the more, more recent leaked drafts of this investment and sustainable development chapter that China is opposing any inclusion of language regarding uh, the ILO conventions, whether that is framed in results terms or whether that's framed in best efforts terms or, or, or aspirational terms. Um, now, why exactly that would be, there have been some suggestions, uh, you know, um, there was a presentation, for example, from someone from the ILO that we saw a few days ago. Um, there were some suggestions that perhaps this has to do specifically with its attitude toward um, the way that collective bargaining uh, should take place, which doesn't necessarily align with the way that uh, the international human rights and labor communities uh, do that, um, as well as with some of the forced labor provisions, uh, specifically um, 
uh, the ones um, contained in some of uh, two of the ILO core conventions that it hasn't ratified. So um, there is a big sort of gap there between the practice uh, with respect to other new generation agreements and the practice uh, that appears to be um, uh, developing in the CAI. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, another question from Francisca Pudelko. Um, she refers to the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises. And um, she mentions that when accessing the WTO, China agreed to a commercial behavior of its state-owned enterprises, but it has never delivered on that. And how can we make sure that they would do now under the CAI? Can, can we do that at all as this? I'll take that just because I'll give Anil and Jessa a break after all those market access questions. Um, no, we can't make that. Uh, I mean, we could potentially introduce that as a condition within the CAI that this will only apply to non-state owned enterprises. That's not a condition in the current draft or at least in the leaked version that we saw. Um, and unless there is a provision that, that clarifies that, that it will only apply to non-state-owned enterprises, uh, the, there's no incentive there for China to, to commercialize or to fully commercialize its state-owned enterprises. Yeah, Marcus? No, just, just as a quick comment. Now, in, in other trade agreements of the EU, they had had whole chapters on state-owned enterprise and their behavior and competition and so forth. And of course, it's very clear why it's not in this chat in this in this draft you know i do think this is something another place where um their reports state that there has been some discussions of this issue there are texts potentially floating around out there but we don't have them uh, they weren't included in, in the leaked text that we do have. Uh, and it's going to be important to see what kind of um, language is included uh, on specifically on state-owned enterprises, um, in particular because they, you know, still despite, uh, as was mentioned in the question, despite the promises that were made um, in the WTO context, don't always operate according to this competitive neutrality. They don't uh, necessarily operate on the same terms as far as the ability to access uh, funding, the ability to sort of their, their tax um, uh, liability and so on. On. And so, um, yeah, that's something that is out there. It's a big issue. Um, what are the commitments going to be? Are there any commitments? Uh, that's something that we will have to wait and see when they finally give us a final text. Good. Um, I have one question, which is from uh, Chu Yi. Uh, he mentioned um, all the fields that refer to information and um, freedom of expression, education, news organization, internet content services are listed in China's latest version of the negative list of 2020 for foreign investment. But, but as there are no really big EU companies in this business, are there, are there any incentives from the EU side to push more liberalization in these fields. So there's this question. So China would essentially restrict to be this a bit more clearly EU companies say whatever information providers um, to provide information for the EU. And uh, so, um, but and EU has no big companies in respect. Um, so what this is an area that would need to be ex ex excluded, Tara or, or Jess, I'm not sure who wants. Well, I, think, <laughs> I think the key there is to say no big companies yet, right? Um, as Jess said, that this agreement sets the trajectory moving forward. So we don't actually, it's not just about where we are today, but it is about where we are in 10 years from now. And if EU companies want to develop this in within these areas, 
there is reason for the EU side to push more liberalization in these fields. There is a reason for the EU to try to access Chinese markets in these areas. Those, those reasons, however, need to be balanced against the other considerations that we've mentioned throughout the report, particularly when it comes to issues of freedom of expression um, within the EU, freedom of expression within China, and ensuring that EU companies can respect their human rights. Now, I want to mention something because I, I uh, stupidly, and, I, and I've tried to train myself not to do this, but I stupidly typed an answer to a question um, earlier, and I want to make sure that I address it here, and that's that um, it's not just EU human rights NGOs or human rights academics who are pushing for higher standards for EU companies when they operate abroad or clearer standards on human rights due diligence when they operate abroad. It's also EU companies. So we've seen a lot of companies, particularly in Germany, uh, lead the charge in asking for greater clarity at the EU level for mandatory human rights due diligence. Expectation that, that all companies will play on a level playing field within this area. And right now the CAI doesn't provide for that. And when you're talking about uh, pushing for trade liberalization within some of these areas within China, the EU provision is going to really come up that that protection for EU states or for EU companies is really going to come up against the EU's expectation that those companies ensure respect for human rights, undertake their mandatory human rights due diligence. And they're not going to necessarily be able to do that in China the way that they would be able to do that elsewhere. And so there needs to be a, a really clear thinking through about where we are now, where we want to be economically within the EU in 10 years, and how we ensure that our companies develop in a really sustainable and human rights compliant way. There are uh, a number of questions regarding the, in some way, the politics now of, of the um, looking forward, uh, you know, uh, the politics of an agreement. There's uh, one question from Judith Kaiser. Are there signals from individual EU member states that they are not willing to agree to the CIA, at least not under the current state of negotiation. And uh, another question uh, similar to that, Ivoslav Ganshev asks, both the internal politics of the EU and the geopolitical environment will shift in 2021 with the new Biden administration, the new EU presidency of Portugal, the upcoming German elections, the new Magnitsky ad as of yesterday, etc. How are the chances of reaching an agreement on the CIA change uh, likely to change in 2021 and will political shifts undermine the possibility of reaching an agreement after December. So it's a bit more on this politics of the negotiation process. Not sure whether someone wants to, to look into this. Jessica. Um, if I can just first add one thing to the previous comment and then jump to this, mm -hmm. uh, this mm -hmm. one as well. Um, uh, I wanted to note that it does look like um, with respect to the specific areas that will be opened under this agreement, um, I, I believe the question was referring to the new 2019 um, coming into effect this year, 2020 uh, foreign investment law in China. Um, and that one uh, has a much more extensive negative list and the EU is hoping to kind of cover some of those areas, uh, specifically telecoms has been mentioned as a big area of concern. Um, the exact limits, of course, again, we'll have to see in the final text. I'm sorry to keep saying that, but it's true. Um, there is an exception, however, um, uh, in the scope of the agreement written into the leaked text for anything having to do with quote unquote cultural industries. Um, and this probably would uh, cover some of the areas that were mentioned in that particular question. So um, there'll be a, a question on, on that. I just wanted to sort of add that to what was already, already stated. Um, now, uh, I'm not actually sure which member states have um, significant, expressed significant reservations. I've um, been told that many of the member states are frustrated with the level of access that their um, negotiate, um, not negotiators, but that uh, the political uh, parties and, and um, governments have been given uh, to what's being negotiated right now and that that makes it a little bit difficult to develop 
uh, coherent positions when one is just given sort of scraps of access to various parts of the text. Um, but in terms of sort of internal dynamics of the member states, um, I'm not sure if Marcus, do you have more information on that or? Yeah, that's um, that's something that I think is is uh, is outside my personal scope of expertise. Yeah, Marcus. Can I just add? I I don't have any sort of specific information, of course, on on member states. I just want to to maybe quickly comment on the geopolitical uh, underlying assumption there. I well, obviously, I mean, the German presidency made it clear that they had a particular interest, or the chancellor had a particular interest, a personal interest, maybe even in making you know EU-China agreement part of the success story of the. That was all before Corona, right? So um, I, I don't think that matters will change a lot in 2021. I mean, if we, if we look at what we see on the table, we see there are some, still some significant divergences. So I would, I would bet my five cents on that they will come up, certainly not with something uh, really agreed on um, anytime soon. Now, what's interesting to watch, and this is again a political question, in recent years, we've seen that um, more often than not, we would hear that there has been a political agreement and that things have been clear that we just need a bit of, you know, here and there technicalities, legal scrubbing, or whatever they call it. And then we are tricked into the assumption that things have already been agreed when in fact matters are not yet agreed. So I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of this year, or the beginning of next year, we hear, oh, there's been a political agreement. And, but then if you start asking about the details, ah, you yeah, know, so, so I think this is something that we, we as, as observers, at least as political observers, we should also um, um, uh, pay attention to. Yeah, yeah, thank you. There are two uh, specific questions also now on the, um, you know, what we know about the draft text that we you know. One is, is there an evolution class at large in the CAI, uh, Irene Rudetron? And uh, the Heinrich Böll Stiftung Yangon uh, asks the question, does the agreement under negotiation now include Hong Kong just as a part of China or are, is uh, Hong Kong now you know, under special law and the special clauses. Um, any reference to that in the draft? I'm just going to say I don't know what an evolution clause is. If that, if anybody else does, then, mm -hmm. um, or if we could have a clarification on that, if no one's sure as to what that means. Maybe we'll just wait until uh, in the uh, Q&A session there, there's uh, Irene Rude Trump uh, answers that. And on the Hong Kong question, uh, any takers? Is Hong Kong referred to in the agreement in any way? I, I don't think that we were sure on that. On that um, and it, it would be difficult for us to check really fast and give you an answer. The draft is a picture document that's unsearchable, so you do have to go through each of the clauses. Uh, and so I, I'm going to be honest that I, it doesn't strike anything in my memory that Hong Kong is either included or excluded within the mm -hmm. agreement. Mm -hmm. There is nothing explicit in the agreement, I think, that refers to Hong Kong or the geographical coverage as, as, it, as the leak stands, but I, I have to double check. Good. Um, then there were, was um, a question regarding the um, Belt and Road Initiative. Alexander Donsov asks, currently the Belt and Road Initiative um, is further being linked to the EU and multiple projects in that framework are being developed in the EU. At the same time, Russia and China politically cooperate on the matters of countering and opposing human rights and others allegedly Western value. Does the Belt and Road Initiative and Russia influence the development of the CIA in any form? And is this kind of politics considered when companies cooperate between China and the EU? It's obviously quite a big question or a complex multiple questions in one um, rather than on the politics of it. 
uh, I mean, um, any time sort of big geopolitical stuff is happening, sort of whether that's Russia, whether that's the U.S. elections, uh, etc., that's going to, of course, influence sort of the negotiating context uh, and and that type of thing. But in terms of how exactly um, you know various negotiators are being told to weigh and balance these uh, these various factors, those things we are not privy to. Good. Then there were questions that uh, refer also to probably us as organizers. Would it have been possible to have an, a Chinese international lawyer to participate in the seminar? And uh, they, we seems to be dominated by very serious anxieties about China. And why uh, there was another question: Was a Chinese representative invited to elaborate? I mean, this was um, is first of all now a seminar which uh, you know tries to give shed some light on what is being negotiated and um, uh, under the um, you know actually leaked text. And um, I think it is unlikely that um, you know a civil society lawyer in China would have access to the text at all, and not even the leaked text. <laughs> and uh, our own experience is that the um, you know the the space for civil society acting and the freedom of expression within china is has been shrinking during, during the past couple of years we have an office in china it is under serious scrutiny our partners as well and we are really facing a climate of increasing um kind of yeah shrinking spaces and, and increasing repression so we wanted this as a first approach but we won't exclude that at some stage it might be useful to uh, to open such uh, discussions to a more di dialogue. Uh, but at this stage, I think it was premature. Tara, maybe you wanted to come in on this as well. Yeah, I want to distinguish between having anxiety about China and having legitimate concerns and criticisms about Chinese state policy, because there is a difference between those two things. I'm not anxious about China in terms of what it does within China. I'm not anxious about China in terms of where it sits on the global political stage. But when we're talking about where the EU's policies are going to go and what the EU is going to set for itself, not just now, but again in the future, we need to be really honest about the differences between the Chinese government and EU member states in terms of some of these fundamental issues, including freedom of expression. And if we don't, if we're not honest about that, if we're not clear about that, then we're not actually doing any service to the EU, to EU laborers, um, or to the public discourse around, around these investment treaties. And so I think that describing our, our criticisms as anxieties, I think isn't actually a fair or appropriate critique. I think that this is what we're presenting, our lessons learned. The EU has very rarely been in a situation, I think TTIP would be the one exception to this, where it's, go where it's negotiating one of these agreements with somebody or with a state that is at least in a financially equal position and probably in a financially stronger position. Um, and that's as of right now, China's strength financially is growing. And understanding what that means in terms of the risks to EU member states, it's a different situation than when the EU is negotiating its agreements with Vietnam. It simply is. And that doesn't have anything to do with anxiety. It has to do with the financial realities and the geopolitical realities of where the EU sits in relationship to China financially and what that will mean in terms of how Chinese investors can influence and impact uh, EU foreign policy objectives and EU domestic objectives. We've seen this play out in other situations where the EU hasn't been the less vulnerable state. Uh, you know, and we see it not just with EU's agreements, but around the world in terms of international investment agreements and how these agreements facilitate the privileging of investors over other public policy goals, other public policy interests, over um, individual human rights defenders, communities, and, envir and the environment. And so what we're really signaling to you right now is that there are areas that need to have clearer, more coherent policy uh, considerations outlined and addressed so that the EU really, if the EU wants to go into this agreement, that it knows what it's going into 
and that it complies and facilitates the EU's broader interests, not just its narrow interest at market liberalization. Can I just add one quick thing to what Tara said? I think also when we were thinking about this report and this agreement, we were also thinking a lot about EU businesses and how they can end up being complicit. Um, and so I think there, this is an opportunity to also discipline EU businesses operating overseas because day after day we see EU businesses um, benefiting from exploitation, not only in China, but, but around the world uh, in their supply chain. So this agreement should not overlook that as well. So this isn't about anxieties about China or just about the Chinese policies, but also about what EU businesses are capable of doing when they're operating overseas uh, or, or, or operating through supply chains overseas. Thank you, Anira. Um, we are actually close to the end of this session, and I would uh, direct one, you know, final question to our panel. Um, you know, going forward, what would you recommend to, what would you your your ask or recommendations to EU negotiators going forward in this, um, in these negotiations process? Would you? suggest actually it's not worth pursuing the negotiations at all and stick to the old BITs. Is there, um, or are you essentially saying, you know, if you carve out X, Y, Z, maybe we, that can still be useful. What would your, what would your, your recommendations and suggestions be? Can I start? Okay, so I think part of the problem that we're seeing here is that the CAI, there isn't policy coherence between the CAI and the EU's other objectives, the other EU's other stated values. Um, and that sometimes happens when you're negotiating investment agreements where there's a little bit of policy incoherence, but we're not talking about a little bit of policy incoherence. We're talking about massive policy incoherence here. Um, and, and as Jessica and Marcus and Anil have already said, you know, if the, if the Canadian standard is, is the gold standard, we're not even in the top 10 with the CAI, um, you know, top 10 finishers in terms of a race. And, and so I, what I would say is that, I'm not gonna say don't, don't go into the agreement or don't continue to negotiate, but there needs to be greater involvement by other areas of the EU in this discussion. There needs to be greater transparency so that EU member states and their citizens can really participate and, and figure out where we're sitting in terms of our public policy goals and help the EU prioritize what needs to be pursued and what, what can be compromised on. And we haven't had that discussion, we haven't had that transparency. And, and as a result, we don't have the policy coherence that we need at the EU level. Thank you, Tara. Not sure, Anil, Jessica, Marcus wants to take the floor. Please, Marcus. No, I think oh, Jessica no. unmuted yeah. herself first. Okay, so she sorry. No, no, yeah, she yeah, please, that. please, Jessica. <laughs> no, it's all right. I mean, I think, um, um, you know, I, I would second uh, what Tara said about policy coherence, transparency, and so on. Um, but I also think, um, you know, one, one thing I wanted to add is that um, we've consistently heard from the commission, from negotiators that they, you know, this agreement is going to be another progressive agreement that, you know, it's all about substance over speed and these kind of things, but it doesn't really seem to be living up to those promises. Uh, and if it were, if I were the one who was getting to make the decisions about this, uh, I would uh, hope that um, they would see this as an opportunity to create a better agreement, an agreement that more clearly reflects EU values and that pushes forward on all of those progressive commitments rather than uh, compromising on them, um, you know, in order to get a quick deal done. Thank you. Marcus. Okay, I'll Oh, 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 Anil, 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 yeah, please. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, dif it's difficult to choose, um, but I would just, I just want to reiterate that um, rather than recommending something specific, 
that the investment treaties already exist between member states and China. So I think the EU has to reflect on what is this agreement for? What does it add um, other than market access? I mean, it's just not going to be focusing. It cannot simply focus on that aspect of the agreement. But also, um, even if the EU was to, to conclude an agreement with China, um, that is better than the current draft. Um, there is no, there is no obstacle to Chinese investors to use other investment treaties that the EU has or member states have signed with with third third states um, to channel their investments um, through that to sidestep any protections that can be in the in this in this agreement in the future. Um, I would definitely be very, very serious about considering investor obligations um, in this treaty. And I know that sounds like a, like a Christmas list, but um, I think that's, that's, that's really important for this agreement. Thank you. Can I just add one last thought? And, and I think it's, it's important because Jörg, you mentioned that and Neil raised that as well. I mean, we, we do have um, what 26 or 25 bits, I mean, depending on no, 26, right? 26 bits with member states with the exception of Ireland, who seem to do fine, with just five bits that they have all together, if, I, if I'm if i not mistaken. Um, bits are bilateral investment Bilateral treaties. investment treatments, yeah. So if we want to reform them, we want to get rid of the old ones, that's a good objective, but then we should then we should follow that objective, just like Anita was saying, you know, come up with some ideas on investor obligations and so forth, but not, mingle that with all this market access stuff. And if, if the EU and China want to liberalize their market, there is a multilateral organization for that, which is called the World Trade Organization. And I, I believe this is where these things should be done. Thank you all. Um, we have actually now reached the end of the time we have allocated for our uh, seminar. So thank you so much for this really interesting debate. I think it's just the, the start of a debate that needs to happen, that urgently is needed. Um, this was really exciting and I learned a, a lot and I hope um, all participants learned something. So thank you, uh, Tara, Anil, Jessica, Markus, for your contributions. Thank you to all our audiences. To, for their questions and participation. And we will be distributing also the recording of this event to those who have registered but couldn't make it. So thank you so much. And I recommend it to everyone reading the interesting study that uh, was done by the team. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.